Okay, hi there. So, um, I got already told before my talk that everybody knows what I'm talking about, so in theory I can just go away. But um, still, we have it here, I'm here, so let's still do it. Um, from, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Orthos 2. Um, you see the logo on the right, um, and I want to talk about its past, its present, and its future. Um, so, uh, before we get to the past, present, and future, um, for those who don't know, I want to talk a little bit about what Orthos 2 is how it's uh, architected, and then we get to the interesting part that I want to talk about. So, what is it? Um, Orthos 2 is in uh, its core functionality a reservation system for machines. Um, but it has more functions, um, and in the very old days, um, before I joined even the company, it was an inventory management system. This is not the case anymore, but many of its functionality and features is still uh, trying uh, to refer to that old days. Um, but currently it's limited to uh, searching for the hardware that you need, um, then provisioning this hardware with an operating system of your choice. We're at SUSE, so nominally it's SLES on OpenSUSE. Um, and in the end, reserve that machine so no one else can take it away. In case you haven't used it, uh, our main internal instance in SUSE is ortos2.arc.suse.de. So, now how is it built? Um, Orthos 2 is a web UI, as such, I have a web server running on a random VM, and it's showing you the uh, web interface. Then when you click on something, in 99% of the cases, Orthos will say, hey, I need to do something, so the need to do something is the cobbler server. The cobbler server is an orchestration tool that essentially um, manages the configuration files of DHCP, DNS, and TFTP, and is generating that on the, as instructed by Orthos. And then, uh, if you want to do something with a machine, like install it, the machine is being rebooted by cobbler, and then installed by cobbler. So when the machine is installed, how does Orthos know what the machine has for capabilities? So we have a small set of Ansible playbooks that get executed over SSH, um, and then Orthos is directly going to the machine, as it knows what the machine is as a target, because it's also configuring cobbler. Um, so Orthos itself is kind of like a super orchestration daemon that is uh, sitting over a number of uh, networks. So in this graph, you see only one network displayed here, but in SUSE as well, we have multiple networks and as such, multiple cobbler networks. So imagine this blue thing multiple times. Um, so now to what was Orthos in the past. So in the very old days, um, that uh, is probably even predating most of the people in this room here, Orthos was a PHP-based front end um, that had some custom bash scripts that then did some very specifically tailored tasks that, that we had in our network. Then someone came along and said, hey, 80% of that work is already done upstream, so let's power our Orthos instance by a cobbler as a backend. Um, and then someone came along and, hey, PHP is not the peak of technology anymore, let's do something about it. And then they said, hey, while we're about it, we do try to improve um, upon our legacy. And this is when uh, Orthos 2.2 was perceived um, as a Python Django-based web UI with Cobbler as a backend as well. This ensured that the data that we had in the old PHP application could seamlessly taken over um, by, the, uh, by Orthos 2. So now, I joined uh, SUSE Labs um, uh, roughly six to seven months ago, and in that time, I did some things. Um, first of all, I noticed it's very hard to update the configuration, and it's very complicated to roll out new networks, and so I said, hey, SUSE IT has this nice thing called SALT. And SaltStack, for those who don't know, is a configuration management system that is basing upon essentially YAML with a few extras. Um, it's logic. And then uh, I said, hey, okay, now I have Cobbler and Orthos in our Salt instance and manage it this way. This gave, it, gave us a drastic improvement already as we had the need to reprovision the 
uh, network in Nuremberg Franken campus, uh, and this was done thanks to the salt uh, code base that we crea that I created um, quite quickly. Um, then I said, hey, well, most of that stuff I do would be useful for the community. So I said, hey, let's write a salt formula, which is essentially a collection of salt code that gets grouped um, generically. Um, but sadly, I wasn't able to deploy it into production yet, but that's planned for the coming months. Um, then we had a very nice intern and apprentice who worked together to create Cobbler TFTP. Because as it turns out, for those of you who have used um, uh, Cobbler and Orthos uh, already, it takes quite long to install something. And the reason for that is that the TFTP tree is, if you have multiple hundred machines in your, uh, in your orchestration, it takes quite long to, for every machine to write six files to the file system because six files, uh, multiple hundred machines, takes quite some time. And we said, hey, 99% of the time, we don't need those files. So why not do it dynamically and uh, uh, create those files dynamically? And this is what Cobbler TFTP does. It's a TFTP server that dynamically spits out the configuration um, that the machine that is currently booting requires. This is um, not yet deployed in production, but we did successfully boot a test machine already in our network. As such, this is also something that will be coming in the future. Um, then something that is very recent, uh, thanks to uh, Martin, who is uh, sitting in the audience here, um, uh, we have an Orthos te 2 test instance now, which is identical to the production instance, as the only different differentiator is the database server being used at the moment. Which is very convenient, because if we want to develop new features for Orthos, which we do want, because um, there is development uh, in, in our OS, which needs to be tested, um, we can very conveniently try that out without breaking our production. Um, and then something which is um, also old and new at the same time, um, we have now our uh, serial console back. Um, back when um, Max Tohof was still existing as an office from SUSE, um, we had uh, a serial console server that had physically had C screen installed that um, had most of the machines physically connected. Um, now, in our new data center in Prague, we, uh, we figured like, hmm, our hardware is a little bit more modern. Most of the hardware has a board management processor, meaning we can remotely over IPMI access the serial console. As such, um, I was like, hmm, we don't need it anymore. Turns out we do need it because um, uh, not everything is x86 and not everything has an, a board management controller. And then uh, the hardware enablement teams came and said, hey, couldn't you resurrect it? And so I went to work and I resurrected now the serial console that we had in Max Tohof as a virtual machine, again with C-Screen. Um, so now, what is my plan in the, in the future? Um, I distinguish between two things. Um, the infrastructure and the development of the tool itself. Infrastructure-wise, at the moment, there is a very nasty hard requirement for authors that the DNS is previously existing. So you cannot do anything or change anything in authors without the DNS previously having applied that change, which is very inconvenient because we need this needs to be done manually. This is nothing that the user itself can do, because this is something that I or someone from our, my, the power users needs to do. Um, this is a... Regression I said in the tool that's very old and that was done on purpose. Um, I think it's not um, timely anymore and as such this is something with high priority for me because it causes a lot of my uh, work uh, to do that and maintain that DNS uh, in advance to the actual changes um, to remove that hard requirement. Um, secondly, um, IT has come to me and said it's nice that you do DHCP and everything but if something breaks, you break more than your own stuff. So um, we said, hey, the, um, a nice thing would be to have a DHCP proxy, um, and then, then we can decouple uh, networks and components from each other, and then ho have better encapsulation of our tools, which means hopefully that it will run more stable in the future. And then last but not least, to improve your user experience, um, I want to deploy Cobbler TFTP to speed up the lengthy installations of currently half an hour. And with Cobbler TFTP, hopefully that then gets trimmed down by half to uh, roughly 15 minutes. Um, Development-wise, um, currently missing, and I know that many of you are eagerly waiting for it, but uh, I haven't gotten to it yet, um, 
uh, cobbler and orthos needs cloud init, ignition, combustion, and agama support. Um, I know that especially agama is a very early topic, but I have written it down because I know it will arrive at some point in my office, and as such, I'm planning already for it. Um, this, is, this work is already started, but it's not finished, and as such, this is something that I'm planning to, to equip our uh, authors instance with. Um, we heard it many times on the conference already, containerization is also not stopping um, of Orthos. As such, Orthos and the comp um, components will hopefully be all containerized within the next or one or two years. And um, since it, as it turns out that many information on Orthos is already in other tools that we have, um, for example, Netbox, um, it would be very convenient if you could deduplicate this information. So I do want to create a Netbox integration for authors. So the main source's information is not the manually um, inserted information into authors, but is the most of the time already previously entered in our asset management Netbox, um, the information. Um, yeah, and then now, what is there to fix for me um, besides what I already said? So I know the machine setup as said takes ages, that's why I want to deploy Cobbler TFTP. Um, the goal is to get the installation down to 10 minutes roughly, so we, every one of us uh, can drink one coffee and doesn't uh, drink a whole uh, bottle of coffee or brew it, um, grow the beans, whatever you do in that half an hour that it takes to install a machine at the moment. Um, and then at the moment, uh, IPv6, we all know, um, is very new and exciting, and as such, it doesn't work. Um, uh, yeah, um, ter as it turns out, the hard thing for authors with IPv6 is um, well, everything has IPv4, and that's pretty trivial to, to do, but uh, synchronizing the address that is set in the DNS hard-coded between IPv4 and IPv6 is uh, very, uh, very not very easy to do from a pure service side. As such, I'm in contact with the Wicked maintainers and the network ma uh, manager maintainers to somehow fix that now. Um, then the list of installable distributions that we have uh, grew over the years quite large. I, of course, clean that list regularly up, but it is still very messy. Um, there will be improvements done. Um, when exactly? Um, I don't have a... I'm not a wizard, but um, I hope to do it soon. Um, then we have the Serial Console tab for S Console in the web UI still broken. I'm also aware of that, and this is also my roadmap to be fixed. And hopefully then you have a single pane of glass for the machine that you're currently working with, which is then the author's web UI. And then at the moment, if you um, SSH into a host that uh, you reserved for yourself, the message of the day generation that uh, says who is currently um, owning the machine temporarily and using it um, is not reliable. Most machines are working, but uh, apparently some do slip the automation. Why that is, um, is uh, not yet known, but uh, I do have been uh, kindly uh, been told that yesterday, or, or no, the day before yesterday, um, as such, uh, yeah, this is also something to be investigated. Um, if you do regularly work with authors, I do sometimes get the feeling that some people don't ask me, or if they ask me, they don't know where to ask. Um, so I try to list all the channels that you can reach me. Um, if you need help in general with authors, just in Slack, help authors. If you need with Cobbler, and you know what Cobbler is, feel free to go to help Cobbler. If you think you have an instance-specific problem with uh, Orthos, um, then feel free to go to Baxilla and use the product Orthos um, and create an issue there. If you think, uh, well, it's the upstream code that's broken, you can go to GitHub. We can just, you can just open an issue there. Um, I have linked the repository URL later. Um, then if you have um, need urgent help with something, please use Jira SD. This is the ticket that I can help you best with if quick help is needed. And if you have machine-specific issues to save you the need to go to Jira SD, there is a nice report problem button in red on the um, bottom right corner. Just use it, it opens an email, and then I will get immediately notified. And last but not least, I do see that we have new colleagues, and those new colleagues um, find themselves sometimes confused by the instructions that are documented. So if you find any documentation issues, um, then just report them. Um, most of the time, since the documentation, 
documentation is auto-generated, it's very quick to fix it. I just don't see it because I myself don't read it that often as I uh, use the tool quite regularly. And last but not least, I hope uh, everyone is aware of it. Please give me feedback. There are days where I don't hear about anything and then uh, there's days where everyone says everything's broken. Um, it would be nice <laughs> if uh, we could uh, um, spread out the feedback over uh, a more um, regularly so you regularly tell me, hey, something's working very good today or something seems to be hanging. Um, sometimes uh, if you tell me something's hanging, I can un un unlock it, uh, unblock it and then things go smoother for everyone. So talk to me. Um, I do love to hear what you have to say. Um, if you have too much time and you know Python, here are the Git repositories. Uh, feel free to contribute. The issues should be quite extensive extensive, and if not, I can extend them very easily. Um, and as a last thing, before I open the room for questions, some numbers um, and graphs, because uh, at the moment I find it quite impressive that our SUSE internal instance is managing roughly 670 machines um, over the various networks, and that most of them at least are quite regularly used. Um, so from my side, um, we have roughly 10 minutes to spare, I think. Um, so I know that everyone wants to have lunch, but I do hope that we have some questions. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Um, that was all from me. Thank you for listening to my short update about Orthos. So I'm a packager. The other week I had the unfortunate circumstance of having a bug that only affected PowerPC and 64-bit Arch. And so I tried to use Orthrus and I didn't get very far. And I was wondering if it was possible to have um, several pre-configured VMs for each architecture with a clean operating system on that we can just reserve SSH into, um, install our packages, test our things, and then when we release it, you wipe it back to the clean state because that would make our life and processes much easier. Okay, why specifically virtual machines? Um, because they're more scalable, but hardware machines would work as well. Yes, so in theory, if a machine is handed back to the pool, it should be wiped. So, in theory, if you reserve a machine, you should be able to directly SSH into it and it's clean. If that's not the case, then normally something on the machine is broken. That can be a, a multitude of things, but then that would be a prime example yeah. of just hit that red button, machine's not working. Yeah, okay, I struggled, I struggled to find a machine I could SSH into, mm -hmm. maybe because I was looking for virtual machines rather than physical machines, but I, yes. so I was looking for something with like less 15 on it. Yes. And I struggled. So virtual machine, so virtual machine manager is a, is a beast of its own. And Authors is primarily intended to manage physical machines. There are some basic virtual machine management functionality available, um, but um, it's something of this neglected code parts that you do not want to touch because it's kind of working, but also not. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, if the need for virtual machines arrives um, um, more prominent, uh, I can have a look um, uh, what, with PowerPC uh, in particular, what I can do about that. Um, I will take it home as a note for myself. Um, but uh, what you uh, explained should have worked. I, um, I guess if there is enough physical machines for everyone, then you don't need virtual machines. Yes, of course, but that would be yeah. bad resource usage. It's actually interesting. I have more or less the same question. So the mm -hmm. thing is, I've run into the problem many times that, for example, I need to debug a package that mm -hmm. doesn't build on S390 or ARCH64. And the thing is, uh, I usually do that in Debian mm -hmm. because, like in Debian, I'm you know I'm also a Debian developer, and we just have porter boxes, and I can look up S390x. That's Zelenka.debian.org. Mm -hmm. I log in, I create a shroot, and I can like test build the package and this is actually something that I would prefer to have for OpenSUSE as well, because it, it just takes me crazy f trying to navigate through authors and you know rem remembering my credentials and all that stuff. And 
Um, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't I agree see that's the, convenient. The, the, I don't see the point like with security because the thing is, you don't need uh, root uh, permission to, to build packages, right? So like in, in Debian, there's just root. I, I create the root, I install the build dependencies and try to build it and see if it fails. And that's the, like most of the cases, I mean, that's the main use case for me why I need, for example, access to an S390 machine, right? I, I don't have a mainframe at home. So like there's no point in like, Sure. Um, how we build packages, I do not want to touch here. And uh, as it turns out, if you use OSC at some point, you do need to enter your sudo password. Um, as such, uh, let's please uh, put a, um, brackets around that. Um, but well, you can use something like shrewd, so. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, but um, from there, it, we have CVEs that we need to fix, and we have people that reserve a machine. There's nothing preventing you not reserving a machine and logging in. However, I would strongly discourage that because as it turns out, it, it, we, when shared resources get used in a shared way, um, things start to escalate rather quickly if 200 people um, go into a limited set of machines, especially S390, we have 10 VMs there. Um, if we have a security specific CVE um, then for S390 or a um, virtualization bug in S390, you most probably have like eight or some machines available. So I would strongly recommend reserving a machine, even if it's just for a day or so. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, but, but is there actually such a high demand for like non x86 architectures that would like. This is actually a problem of the workflow. Because as Enno rightly said, there's something called OSC. And that actually is capable of building on S390. You just need to specify the architecture, please build an S390, and guess what? It'll build an S390 without you even having to worry about any machine whatsoever. So it really you is- You mean with QEMO? No, OSC itself, the program OSC. That schedules the build of your package on the architecture but of I your choice. But I want to build it locally to be able to debug. As I said, it's a matter of workload. I want. Nothing says you have to. So if you want, there might be some hurdles to take. One of these hurdles might be remembering the password, but that's not really where we can help you with. Okay, and I, um, and so and so the I don't want to discourage, discourage you. I, but, I'll um, keep using the Debian infrastructure. Right. Okay. Whatever. Because so, it's too it's too complicated. Sorry, I don't want to remember all that stuff. You know. Yes. <laughs> so, Hannes. Uh, your comment really makes my blood boil because I think you're mostly a kernel developer, so you've never really dealt with packaging issues. Uh, so you don't know uh, what pe people need to go through there when they use OSC build and these things. So I. Uh... So if OSC isn't working, why don't we start improving OSC? <laughs> <laughs> OSC build runs on your local machine. No. So, yes, it does. It depends, if, depends if on the parameters. You can, uh, there are two modes. Either upload it and let OSC, uh, let the IBS or OBS building it, or build it to your local machine. In yeah, fact, but that's... then you cannot get into the build anymore afterwards. Can you? You have, you have all the log files. What do you need to log into? Uh, okay. <laughs> no, no, seriously, seriously. Why, why would you, why would you, why, uh, okay, no, no, please, pray tell me. Why would you need to log into the build system? Because the logs are not good enough. Yes, and, and you sometimes need to, uh, need to check what actually had happened in your... Yeah. Okay, but then you're just telling that OSC isn't working for you, right? The only other point I would say for S390, my Friesenegger has the S390 self-service, which is an alternate. So my Friesenegger has the S390 self-service, which is a rapid deployment for S390, which is a, a better alternative than Autos for me. So yeah, because Autos is not there for virtual, it's, Autos is not a virtual machine deployment tool. It never was, it never will be. I'm just saying for issues like packaging where you don't care about physical hardware. 
Yeah, sure. So, and, yeah. and it's not not a deployment tool. Yeah, but it's a it's reservation indeed, tool. Then it's indeed the the wrong tool because, as I said, it's primarily aimed uh, at physical machines. So, uh, if you think that uh, you need virtual machines, then indeed there is a great tools also by SUSE IT where you can get virtual machines very um, easily with ITPE, etc. Um, Orthos is aimed at physical infrastructure. If you need to reproduce a bug with a specific network card, if you need a specific kernel that's interfacing with uh, uh, NVMe over TCP, um, if you need a fiber channel, whatnot, all these rare things that are not normally available in a virtual machine, this is what Orthos should so do. I know what Orthos is because we've had, this is probably the 10th Orthos Labs discussion we've had. So here's my personal bug bet. The last time we discussed it, family mode stepping, for x86 didn't make the migration from Orthos 1 to Orthos 2. So if you need a particular x86 system based on FMS information, it's very hard to find. Okay, but this is a very reasonable feature request to do um, to, to do FMS, uh, to implement that FMS is queryable by Orthos in the search. This is something that I wasn't aware of, that FMS information is missing. Um, as said, I joined the department half a year ago, so all those previous discussions are for me not existing. People here know what Orthos is. Mm -hmm. Good. Let me write down that I, uh, uh, that I don't forget about FMS. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. When it will be possible to install machines using Ortos? Using they, what? Using Ortos. Yes, of course, you should be able to install it. That's uh, no, you can't. Because uh, most of the time something is stuck in Ortos. I can tell you, you unstick it, the next day it's broken again. So. Uh, it's not always SUSE IT, Hannes, but. Um, <laughs> But there's also different things at play here. Um, hardware, uh, the, the quality of Orthos that is perceived by the users is 100% dependent upon the maintenance of the hardware. If the hardware is stuck, for example, if it's stuck in a grub prompt, there, uh, and the BMC is not configured correctly or something like that. There's nothing Orthos can magically do. Orthos expect that certain mechanisms in the infrastructure do work. And if those don't work, for example, is uh, what we what we had previously with the uh, with, with the S console, then there is a port uh, there is a port not open. Then I need to open that port. So as such, if if a port closes or if the uh, well, a prime example I had yesterday that I debugged, there is a BMC that says I have an IPFv6 address. Very nice. But if the BMC doesn't respond to that IPv6 address, there's nothing Orthos can do about it if the BMC simply doesn't answer to an IPMI command via IPv6. The, the quality of Orthos is directly connected to the quality of the hardware that we have. And 99% of our hardware are prototypes, so they will have hiccups. There's nothing Orthos, I, or anyone else can do about that the prior prototypes that we have are not production-grade hardware. This is not about the quality of the hardware. I uh, dusted off the PowerPC machines, edit, uh, Upde upgraded the firmware, made sure that the LPARs mm -hmm. are correctly configured, mm -hmm. and now they get grab from mm -hmm. Ortos, mm -hmm. and that's it. Because either you don't get the menu, mm -hmm. or if you do get menu and select an OS to install, it times out when loading the RAM disk and the installer crashes. Yes, that you reported quite a few weeks ago. I acknowledged it, and there is a fix in the pipe for that. Um, and while that's, uh, there are weeks when I have to tell people, okay, if you want to install a machine, then type this into grab prompt because Ortos doesn't do it for you. Okay, um, I have a similar comment regarding the um, system mm -hmm. installations with Ortos. Mm -hmm. So can you just provide this information um, feature in the GUI to so that a uh, next server mm -hmm. and the boot file can be customized so that we don't have to rely on cobbler at all and we can you know just use our own infrastructure in whatever way so let's do something dangerous a live demo um, so uh, ah the vpn is not on wonderful one second we can fix that too um, 50% of what you're asking is already done so if you are a power user and get access to our backend, and then you go to random machine, you will have a timeout bug. 
that I will be fixing, like this. And then if you refresh the page, hopefully, it's a live demo again, then at some point, if it's loading, haha, <laughs> funny, funny, wonderful, <sighs> beautiful, VPN. Okay, it doesn't load, live demo. 50% um, of that is done. The, ne the next server, uh, no, the, the file name can already be overwritten in the back end, that's not an issue, and the next server cannot be overwritten. That's a feature that I already heard from you, I think um, a month or two ago. Um, since the Orphos 2 test instance is available as of yesterday, I can finally start testing stuff like this without breaking production. And as such, you can expect, potentially, that features like this can be easily, easily, um, more easily de developed um, okay. in the future. Yep, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, so I want to go back to that uh, claim that the machines uh, are uh, engineering machines and maybe are not okay. -ish. The same machines was uh, fine when they have been in Germany, were in the hall, mm -hmm. and now they start not working well. I mean, like um, inst installation, auto installation is not working for <coughs> any of our machines. Like they are trying to get uh, some DHCP even address, or they try to download uh, group from uh, some server, and this doesn't happen. Or it happens something like after 15 minutes, uh, like so downloading the first uh, would, uh, which is uh, group, I mean. So the problem is that there is no, uh, the final configuration, or actually the handover of the CE Cola hasn't been done yet. CE Cola is still not finished. CE so The new location for the machines in Prague, where we moved the machines from Nuremberg into Prague. That is that process is still not completed. The machines are mounted, the machines are physically okay, but whether the connection, the physical connection, actually makes any sense whatsoever, is even reachable, hasn't been done yet. We need to touch every single machine, need to validate that each yeah. single machine yeah. works as designed. This yeah. hasn't been done yet. Problem two is that IPv6 is as not sure did you do that did you, did you mention I, it yeah. yes it seems to be a rather new topic in this company unfortunately the default dns resolver prefers ipv6 so if you type in a name and host name it will try to use the ipv6 name come what may if it's not configured then you are actually lucky because then you only get a timeout if it's wrongly configured, you get a connection, but only a one-sided connection because someone configured the firewall wrong. So you actually are stuck because you never get a response back. Okay, and these are all these tiny th weird things. Yes, it's completely annoying. Ask me. But, but uh, why I should care for that? I mean... <laughs> okay, put it right. The other way around. Who should be caring? It's, uh, that is we are trying to do. Yeah, I mean, guess what we are trying here? So we are trying to get the machines in the shape, or rather beat the machines in the shape that they are usable. Just, just to get, get your context, if I have a machine that is properly cabled and properly yeah. working and doesn't have IPv6 enabled, it takes me an hour to get a single host IPv6 ready, assuming everything in the chain is working. And we have, as said, 670 machines and 100 of them are IPv6 enabled. So if I, you can do the math yourself, this will take ages, assuming everything is working, which it isn't. Yeah, so, yeah, and the problem the really is, so one of the problems is, sorry to be now a bit, well, hmm, annoying or even aggressive here, the problem really is that everyone says, it is not my problem. As you just said, why should I care? Yeah, you're right, you shouldn't care. Yeah, I, but I, I have been caring for a while, but nothing is changing, you know, I try to debug the problems and helping the Eno and other yeah. people, but Nothing really happens after a half year. Join the club? I am in the club, you know. <laughs> so, sorry, I, I, have to be, I have to be that one. Martin, are you here? I have to ex... Yeah, right, sorry. Sorry to piss you off again. Um, Anno is waiting for two months now, two, two weeks now, for a merge request for a coupler update to be deployed. This is a merge request which is there. Someone at IT just needs to press enter. 
And we're waiting for two weeks for someone at IT to press enter such that we can deploy the fix for autos. And these are the kind of issues we are facing with. I'm not, uh, yeah, I, I don't understand that, uh, why we have to wait some, well, uh, I suppose uh, uh, Enro is uh, administrator of the Cobbler server, yeah, so he yeah. can do update himself, I no, suppose. No, unfortunately not. That's, that's not because soon as IT said, we have to use their infrastructure for the services. And that means we are tied to their infrastructure and we are depending on them on merge or changes. And can we completely bypass them or somehow? I don't know. We, we, we yes, cannot. we can, but then we are back to square one. That's precisely where we try to step away from. If this turns out to be an issue for you, please, please, please escalate. The only way here to like, do it is... Like how? I have a... Uh, you have a manager. Tell your manager. Uh, Jira tickets, you know. Yeah, and... And that's it. There's Hello. The uh, we are aware of the situation with the merge requests, and we, <clears throat> we changed a little bit the workflow in the team so we will take care of the in incoming new match request, proceed, review them, and manage it. We, we, we know that it was the issue, and we will work on the fix for that. Yeah, and uh, you can have a ticket, that doesn't hurt, or you can try uh, to slack this uh, uh, IT AMA help, you know, there is the things, mm. please can you somebody help me, and somebody from our team will look on it, and then contact the per per person who will do the review. Okay, this is recorded, you know. So, <laughs> probably yes, and it's true, you know. Um, yeah, so, um, constructive feedback. Um, so I joined SUSE 2016, and I was told about this great orthos, that we could just reserve a machine and it will be set up and it works. And uh, I'm not a power user of this, but, um, I used it on, on occasion, mm -hmm. and um, the experiences are a little bit uh, frustrating. Um, mostly that it's basically the web interface doesn't represent the state of the machine. Like sometimes it's stuck or whatever, then you, then you find out that you have to go to the S console, then the S console doesn't work, but there's a S console too that we, everybody knows about, S console, whatever, yeah, it, it's, it, we figure it out. Um, but the, and the annoying thing is, a lot of the machines on Orthos are basically listed there as available or whatever, but they're not reachable. So, again, I do not own the machines. I, I know, I know, tool. I understand, I understand. So, uh, but it would be very helpful if the unreachable machines would be just uh, filtered out or somehow so you don't have to. Mm -hmm go through the list of 20 machines and find out, okay, I can use this number 17. Okay, this one works. No problem, mm -hmm. right? It would, be, it would be just helpful to be able to filter this through. A filter to, um, this, uh, to, to hide uh, uh, machines that are not available is certainly something that is a realistic request. Um, that should be a few lines of Django code. Um, I don't know when I can deploy it and when I can develop it, but I will note it down and I will put it on the list of things to come. Yeah, that would be a, a great help because it's a, if if something that you can just reach mm -hmm. over a network, done, right? Okay, Easy. perfect. Yeah, that's doable. That's okay, reasonable. Thank you. Well, I guess the problem here is not really Ortos uh, showing unavailable machine, but rather Ortos not knowing they are not uh, reachable. Yeah, because uh, for the year, after the years that people were kind of used that when you want a machine in Orthos, you, uh, you need to try four of them until you find one that actually works and the serial console works and everything works. Uh, they became kind of lazy so that they don't actually report the first three as not reachable. So the system doesn't know it shouldn't show them. Yeah. The machine check is done, started at midnight every day, every day and is running then for seven hours. There's those 600 machines to scan them. If they're successful, it takes roughly seven to eight hours. As such, depending on the machine you're picking between um, uh, Nuremberg time zone, uh, midnight and seven or eight o'clock in the morning, you will have uh, no up-to-date status as it's the status from the last night. And then some things get stuck. I can unstuck them, but again, um, something gets stuck uh, and the machines then start to keep stuck. And as you said, if the first three machines are not for me reported as something stuck, because if Ansible hangs in the SSH connection, never 
Docker reports back. Orthos as a tool says, hey, I didn't get an output. Um, don't forget, this is in the end, if we call an Ansible playbook, um, a subprocess wrapper that re relies on the output of the tool. If no output's there, what am I supposed to do with it? Is the machine now available? Is Ansible stuck? It's, it's a hard balance I need to strike there, and the reality is that keeping the infrastructure running as is is requiring at the moment due to the data center move that, as Hannes said, is still not complete, um, uh, taking large amounts of my daily time, and as such, if no one annoys me physically or um, in Slack enough, I will keep hoping that everything is working as intended, which in your case, as you give me, and I know as feedback, and I already know, is sadly not the case. But my days only has eight hours a day. Um, there may be a day with seven hours, and there may be a day with nine hours, but in the end, my day has eight hours a, a day. Um, and I, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, that. Those eight hours are finite, and as such, not everything can be fixed in that eight hours. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the presentation and for the hard work that mm. you are doing. And I agree with the request of uh, having some feedback on the web UE uh, when you do something and your machine is gone, mm. probably, for example, the installation, and it will be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And one question, uh, do we have some uh, asset management thing that can monitor machines that are gone for a long time? and probably raise an alert to someone, then, yeah, the bottleneck will be elsewhere. I know it. But <laughs> at least we have tracked that a machine has gone, uh, has, has gone offline for a long time. So since this is a recorded talk, I don't want to go into the details, but there is work being done at the moment. This is work that works for better or the worse. Um, and as such, um, there will be progress made in that direction, but this is such in the early stages that they don't even have a name for the project, or at least a, don't, not a proper name, and they don't know about the scope of the project that they want to do. Because the last two times they had, we attempted to do this company-wide and not only limited to Susu's labs, this failed horribly. And they didn't understand in the end properly why. Um, at least this was how I was informed. Maybe they don't know something internally, but this was this is the current state. Um, so yeah, progress will be made there on that area, but don't expect something in the next year to change in that regard because uh, this is a company-wide effort um, that is not uh, that I cannot steer personally, and I cannot um, or only to very small bits change, and as such, um, I will have, uh, I will try to give my say in it, but it will take time until that what I say will reach the person that are responsible for implementing the projects. Thank you. Can I ask you, so you said the 600 machines, and it takes seven hours to probe them, that's like 80 machines an hour or something, why, why, so, uh, why so long? That's the first part. Second part, I didn't mm. mean to give the wrong impression, we're really glad that you're mm. here. Really glad. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just from a lot of people in this room's perspective, we've had these discussions about Orthos at previous labs conferences, and so, it, you know, it's yes. always... Be so we're, we're really pleased that you're here doing this, and we didn't, don't get the wrong impression. Yeah. So why t does it take so long? So um, in the end, it's Ansible, and Ansible is taking... Uh, is essentially doing... Uh, is a very, very, very fancy sub-process called wrapper in Python meaning you have an SSH connection to each individual machine that needs to be opened by Orthos, the VM, to the target network, which in some times means it needs to cross the ocean and back, which means you have latency of 100 machines back to the ocean and uh, over the ocean. Then Ansible takes its time to start up because it copies the Python interpreter every damn time because it's agentless. Um, then you have uh, um, tools like DMI decode that take 10 seconds or something to give you the output that you need because in Orthos you can search through the complete DMID code. Meaning if you have 10 seconds of DMID decode until it spits out everything and you have not only DMID code but also other tools that Orthos is collecting, then you multiply this and then you at the end get the eight hours. So can we do more in parallel? I mean, this sounds like a task that maybe is being serialized more than it needs to be. Um, yes and no. Um, at the moment, we have 20 jobs in parallel, so 20 machines get scanned in parallel. The issue is if one of those job, jobs gets stuck, you have 19. If another one gets stopped, you have stuck at 18. 
And Orthos is from a code base, as I just inherited it a half a year ago. Um, I can't automatically unstack them because the job scheduler, scheduler is custom written. Um, as such, yes, in theory, we can parallelize more, but um, the output of Ansible is then piped into a temp FS, meaning if I have like 50 VMs or something, um, IT needs to provide me a VM with a couple hundred gigs of RAM to have a temp FS running to do this, and then they, <laughs> Martin is already unha getting unhappy about these numbers, so um, no, uh, parallelizing it more would be possible, but it would give us maybe an hour for and not guaranteed end result with the current state of the code base. Um, but yeah, it, it is something, the parallelism of the information collection that I can take well, it home. Sounds, it sounds more like you need to uh, uh, detect that, that they're stuck and, and kill them and restart more than more, more than more. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. It's work in progress. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to make a point about the filtering non Mm -hmm. uh, reachable machines that mm -hmm. uh, please don't like hide them completely because no. if you are desperate, then yeah. you might try to look at the serial console very stuck. You might try the installation over console or over SSH so that you can somehow influence the installation and kind of uh, fix where, where it gets stuck somewhere then you still have a chance to to get around it and, and, and so on. So that's my point. Uh, and uh, also I wanted to ask, so you are the only one who is who is basically, so who takes care of this 60, uh, 670 machines? Mm, yes and no. So. Before me, as a role officially, there was no one in SUSE Labs, according to my information, yeah. that de dedicated as a role could take care of authors. So as of six months ago, you officially have someone to maintain the tool. Everyone else that yeah. did it before was doing it on the side. Yeah. Um, my responsibility is the tool, authors. The machine yeah. maintenance, the physical side, is something that is uh, the that you have a machine owner, someone that enters the machine into the tool. He, the person doing that, is responsible for physically for the machine. That's also why you see um, that essentially this is divided by architecture, and then this gets into a queue, and a person responsible for the architecture is then picking the ticket up, up from the queue. This is nothing that I can yeah. change. This is a, this is a process that's given and that if the manpower provided works reasonably well because it's asynchronous and you, it scales. Um, if there's only one person available because the rest is on holiday, then this works slower. But if everyone's available physically and no one is sick, then this works very well and issues get resolved very well. With some x86 hardware, because I know the colleague is sitting next to me in the office, this even sometimes means that issues get resolved in a matter of minutes um, and not hours even. Um, but that. <coughs> Is, means that someone needs to be physically able to touch the machine, which sure. in the co-location sure. in Prague is normally not the case because then I need to schedule a ticket for the hardware with IT that needs to schedule then someone going to the co-location that then needs to be available at the time that I'm available to debug the issue. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It just, I would like to get the picture and maybe everyone yes. is interested. So which teams are involved in this? So you are actually from... I'm from Hannes' team. Hannes' team, And yeah. uh, Hannes uh, uh, has uh, Stephen Kenyatta in his team as well, who's my colleague. And Stephen and I do take care of the x86 hardware in Nuremberg in the data center. And yeah. we, uh, uh, SUSE IT, via tickets as a proxy, also take care of the hardware in Prague to um, uh, in the extension, aka co-location, meaning that this is the hardware that um, I have a direct reach to. Um, in regard to other uh, ha uh, hardware, I don't know how the teams internally distinguish hardware maintenance, but um, it's the queue, it gets in the queue, and someone from underneath the TPM um, for the corresponding architecture then takes care of, the, care of this. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we have over time, so yeah. I think I would invite uh, a last question, and then I think we should close the forum. Okay. For me as a user, it's absolutely vital to see the true state of the machines. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And what you described that it's a, some kind of cron job that r runs from midnight to 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. and can get stuck. Uh, that seems like uh, something needs to change here. Then uh, you have a uh, button on the right side of your machine, say check now, and then you have an up-to-date to the minute information. Then that runs and it takes yeah. like two minutes or three minutes. That's not put into the queue. That's just directly I'm not really run. interested on what the state of the machine was at, at three o'clock in the morning. I want to know if the machine is okay now. So if, if the current algorithm or technology that's used for it doesn't allow this, maybe this, this might be rethought somehow. Our and physical infrastructure is not capable of uh, keeping alive 600 and something connections alive and check by the minute or the second, depending on the granularity of your request, um, if the machine is there. Um, it doesn't sound right. I, it, this seems like something quite easy to do if you do it differently. It makes... I want to, yeah, but uh, why isn't there a process per machine that checks every machine? That's like having 600 processes is not that much, is it? It's, it's not if you tell SUS IT to provide me a VM with 1,500 threads, um, I can start to do that, do but we, unless they provide me a machine with like 1,500 threads that does this alive every minute or so, that's not going to No, you can do that on the notebook. You don't. Like having 600 processes that every five minutes try to every five minutes try to ping the machine, and if that succeeds, try to stage into it. That that sh that's doable on a notebook or a phone. You don't. Can do that for thousands. This should be rethought and re redesigned because the current situation just doesn't work. And then when we have the true state of the machines visible somewhere, there should, as discussed previously, be someone looking at the list of the machines that don't work and proactively trying to fix them instead of waiting for someone to press the red button because otherwise someone who just needs a machine for five minutes to do some work uh, is, is unable to do it. If the resolution of the machine status is not great enough, um, I can certainly attempt to improve something there, um, but with the current job scheduling and everything, it's not easy to do this in a matter of, uh, to change this in a matter of minutes. I know that if you start a lot of processes and if it doesn't require real-time uh, 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 information, but just every five minutes, you of course can do something, but this implies then scheduling and with the current scheduler, this resolution of five minutes is just not gonna fly because if something gets stuck, um, then everything's stuck after five minutes. No, if, if there's a process per machine, then that process will be stuck for that one machine, but not, not for the whole or also systems. But. Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's do this at lunch break. Um, thank you for your attention and the discussions. <laughs>